Thank you, Julie. If you've got a Bible with you, we're in Matthew 13, but the stuff will be on the screen anyway, so not to worry too much there. We're going to be talking about heart's desire. Heart's desire. I saw a clip from um, oh, Bridget Doan's diary, diary on my Facebook this morning, and it's like, oh, yeah, is that what it's all about? It's not what we're talking about this morning. We're going to open with a bit of celebrity wisdom. Where's my clicker? You know how much I celebrity wisdom? Where is it? Here it is. There we go. All right. You only have to believe that you can succeed, that you can be whatever your heart desires, be willing to work for it, and you can have it. There's Oprah Winfrey. We on board with that? Hmm. What about this one? Just put forth a clear enough request and everything your heart desires must come to you. Hmm. Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, he's a religious leader, really, isn't he? Celebrity, I think so as well. What about Gloria Stefan says this, whatever it is your heart desires, please go for it, it's yours to have. If you're hearing sarcasm in my voice, it's not an accident. It's, this stuff's rubbish, isn't it? I mean, try telling one of those half a billion children who are in extreme poverty. The reason you've got no food is your heart doesn't desire it enough. I mean, that's what they're saying, isn't it? It is an absolute joke. The desires of our hearts, but there is a truth here. There is a truth that our celebrities have grabbed onto. There's something they're capitalizing in with these so-called wise sayings, and that truth is this. The desires of our hearts, however misguided, however misled, is a powerful motivator, isn't it? The desires of our hearts are a powerful motivator. And this is the truth that Jesus is using when he speaks to this parable of the treasure in the field and the merchant with his pearl and the fisherman with their fish. And it's a truth that gives an inkling of what we might just be prepared to do, how far we would be prepared to go if only we knew what heaven was like, what Jesus had in mind for those who love him. Well, today we're going to open with true wisdom, Jesus' wisdom about the kingdom of heaven. We're going to move on to the weeping and gnashing of teeth, which is a phrase that Jesus uses many times in this section of Matthew's gospel. Then we're going to move on perhaps to receive the new wine or to be reminded of this new wine and into the certainty, the hope of nothing short of the kingdom of heaven itself. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us, that you want to know each and every one of us. Open our hearts and minds to your word this morning. Amen. We've got three things to look out for today as we unpack this short bit of text. One, heaven is the greatest treasure of all. Pretty obvious, I think. Number two, heaven is not a carrot. And the alternative is not a threat. Both are real. Both are important. And the third thing is heaven is a gift that we grab hold of by trusting and having faith that Jesus is who he says he is. And lastly, be ready for the Holy Spirit of Christ who is present amongst us. I know you notice something when you come into church this morning. Where two or more are gathered, I am there also. The Spirit of Christ is with us and that's what moves our hearts. Be ready for Christ to touch you this morning. Matthew 13, verse 44. Let me read it again. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and reburied. Then he, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, says Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Look, I doubt there can, be, there can be any argument that if we are faced with the certainty of achieving and receiving what our heart desires, and if that choice was legal and honest, who wouldn't go for it? The man in the field did nothing wrong, and yet he got what his heart desires, great riches. Who wouldn't do the same? In fact, if obtaining riches was less than legal, many still go for it, don't they? And I can attest to that. All my work in telecommunications, I can tell you there's many people I've counseled because they've lost huge amounts of money to internet scams. 
And there is an element of selfishness in that, not to justify the scammers, but they're trying to double their money somehow and they lose it. Just like the merchant, if you're guaranteed a product for your business that's, that's better than any other, would you not want it? And perhaps that parable doesn't speak to you, but if you've got a nice wedding ring or an engagement ring, perhaps, there are things we want to show off, we want to have, we want to share. Or what about that new app if you're a new, of a new generation? We get a new app and we want to tell people about it, don't we? It's a prize, it's special. Phil shared with me a while back about Rain Parrot. Anyone use Rain Parrot? Oh, come on, it's fantastic. It's the best app in the world. You get a notification when the rain's coming. So it's not a forecast, it looks at the radar and it works out where the rain's the direction and it notifies you to get the washing off the line. I'm not affiliated in any way, but it's a good app. Rain Parrot. All right. <laughs> Now, if this is true about the kingdom of heaven, why are, are so many doing nothing for it? Why do so many reject the whole idea of heaven? And even for those of us who have been guaranteed membership, how often do we just sit in that joy? How often do we, in those difficult times, stop and think, you know what? My name is written in the book of life. This is temporary by every measure Heaven is for me. How often do we do that? Now, I happen to believe that heaven is the desire of every heart. I know some people joke about the alternative, but seriously, I don't believe them, not for a second. I mean, if heaven wasn't the desire of every heart, why would we tell our loved ones that grandma's gone to a better place? Why would we tell each other that we're going to see them again if heaven wasn't the desire of our hearts. Jesus is not finished. Have a look at verse 47. He goes on. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there it is at the fire and brimstone, the threat of hell that so many people take offense at, yeah? Right there, Jesus' words. I just got back from holidays. I was, and our last night on the um, Gold Coast of all places, Treasure Island Caravan Park, and the Holy Spirit woke me up early. I know that's what it was. It wasn't indigestion. I didn't need to go to the toilet. It was 6.30. I don't get up then on holidays. Who gets up at 6.30 on holidays? I got up out of bed early. We're always late leaving caravan parks. This morning, just got up and I started packing up quietly. Didn't wake up anybody. And I'm just puttering around outside, doing all the things, connecting all the services and things. And the guy next to me in the caravan wants to have a chat. And the conversation quickly moved on to the things of God. It is an occupational hazard. I'm sorry, I'm not a Bible basher, but it is an occupational hazard. He admitted he'd never read the Bible, didn't grow up in church, didn't know much about it. But after 25 minutes of conversation, we got to the chase of it. He didn't like the threat of hell. He thought that was a bit me. And I said to him what I say to everyone who has that same problem. I said, I tell my children to look both ways and they cross the road. Not because I'm threatening them of cars, not because I want them to be afraid of the cars, but because the danger is real. The danger is real, my friends. The danger is real. The conversation continued, and I'm pretty sure he's gonna go, he's gonna watch the case for Christ. He got it. And the Spirit had prepared me for that conversation. We didn't even leave the caravan late. Can you believe it? We're always late. Perhaps that's what God's got you here for this morning, to hear that message. The danger is real. Have you understood, says Jesus in verse 51. Have you understood these things? Yes, they replied. I don't think they have. But what about us? Have we understood? 
I hope we have. I mean, these parables are pretty straightforward. Yeah, the heaven is important. It's, it's better than a treasure in a field. I hope that me just expounding this has been straightforward as well and clear. But then again, have we really understand, understood? Not the truth of heaven itself, but the implications of this truth and these parables. So I think there's two main implications. One, there is a great joy in our hearts when we lose someone we love into the arms of Christ. Funerals is another big part of my job. And when I see a Christian and we, and we do their funeral, there is a joy and a hope. I remember doing Travis's mum's funeral and I danced down the front, didn't I, Trav? I danced my way out the front. It was a joy to do her funeral. She loved Jesus. But there's also a great sadness. There's an almost unreconcilable sadness when we lose someone to the weeping and gnashing of teeth to quote Jesus. And it's just because their pride won't let them see that they're not in control of their destiny. And the thought of this is horrible, too difficult to entertain. And believe me, I wish I could reconcile this for you. I wish I could this morning, but I can't. Many clergy have given up on hell. Everyone goes to heaven. Universalists, we call them. Many clergy have stopped preaching that hell is a place. It's just non-existence. I'm not sure how weeping and gnashing of teeth is a metaphor for non-existence. We do no favours telling people anything but the full truth about what a speeding car can do to them. And it's no different for this morning, is it? Jesus said, verse 52, therefore, that's with the knowledge of the truth of heaven, how valuable and important it is, the knowledge of what you'd be prepared to do if you just knew how good it was, if you just let yourself think for a moment how great and how powerful and how important it is, well, every scribe who has become a disciple, that's a follower of Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. These words stumped me for a bit. They're a bit tricky to unpack because they're deeply contextual. But it appears that Jesus is referring to these followers, his disciples, as new teachers, as these scribes, unlike the old teachers, the old scribes, these these guys have something they do not. The disciples have a treasure, the desire of the heart as a guarantee, not a carrot. The desires of our heart is heaven itself and it's a guarantee, not a carrot. And what I mean is this, all religions except Christianity presents heaven as something we must work for, something that we may or may not obtain Heaven's dependent on our performance, they say. Only good people go to heaven. Not so, says Jesus. So why does Christianity get such a bad rap for all this fire and brimstone stuff? I don't know. I mean, perhaps it's because we're prepared to talk about it where everyone else just pushes it under the rug. All that's asked of us is that we let go of our pride Choose to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And heaven is yours. But back to our disciples. They are the teachers of old. They're not just the teachers of the new. They're the teachers of the old. They teach the law, the Ten Commandments, the legal standard, the holiness, the otherness of God. And it's true, it matters, because without a standard, how do we know right from wrong? Things have changed in just my short life. I mean, I'm 47 this year. <laughs> Look, things have changed. What was right and wrong 10 or 10 years ago is different today, yeah? Where are we going without that standard, without the Ten Commandments, without the law? Everything becomes permissible. <sighs> they are the teachers of the new. Heaven is a gift, a treasure in a field, something that must be claimed. And how do we claim it? I think I've made that clear. 
but we claim it by proclaiming. Let me just say it one more time. But I'll use Paul's word, the Apostle Paul from Romans 10. He says this, this is how we, this is how we claim heaven. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Of course, these words are an act of faith. Every person sitting in this room is exercising faith right now. How do you know that seat's not gonna collapse? You've got faith that it won't. How do you know this roof's not gonna come down on you? You have faith that it won't. The faith we have in Christ is no bigger step It is trust in him as who he says he is. And it's super easy except when it isn't. (laughs) To proclaim Jesus is Lord means we have to admit that we are not Lord. To proclaim him as Lord means I've got to admit that I am not. And the old way of legalism of every other religion, even spiritualities, I had a dollar for every time I'm heard. I'm spiritual but not religious. Even atheists. It's an attempt to do life my way, isn't it? If I do X, Y, Z, I get heaven, my heaven, my terms, my way, as that famous funeral song goes. If anyone chooses my way at their funeral, I will be not playing it. The problem is my way is a mess. Well, actually, my way would be great if everyone would just do it. My way is a mess, yeah? How can we not see that? Even us Christians need to let go of our pride, especially us Christians, time and time again. I know I keep trying to do things my own way. Two steps forward for Jesus, three steps back for Michael. (laughs) Over and over again. And then God gives me a good slap and says, get out of bed and talk to someone about Jesus, right? And I'm reminded that he pulls the strings, he's in charge. Let go of the old, grab hold of the new, for the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. I'm almost done and it's yours. What have we discovered this morning? What are we reminded about? Firstly, heaven is the greatest treasure of all. There can be no mistaking that. And it is the desire of our hearts. It's not a carrot. It's not even a threat. Well, the alternative is not a threat, I should say. Both are real. And thirdly, heaven is a gift that we grab hold of by trusting and having faith that Jesus is who he says he is. There's not a serious historian today that wouldn't agree that Jesus walked the earth. He is no myth, historical figure, the son of God who came to die for us. If the Holy Spirit is present in this church this morning, And I'm willing to bet that many of us know it. We feel his presence in our heart. Something said might have convicted you, might have made you think, don't let it go. Don't brush it off. Don't dry it with a hair dryer. You know, your hair's wet. We just dry it and we move on. Don't do that. If the Holy Spirit has convicted you of something, maybe it's to join Alpha. Maybe it's just to know a little bit more. The only faith we need to step into this Eternity is, I want to know more. That's it. From there, Jesus will do the rest. Don't brush it off. Join this gift. Take this gift. Get on this journey. It is the greatest journey of all. Amen. Amen.